Our speaker this evening is Dr. Irvin Waller, who just happens to be a member of this congregation as well, and we're very fortunate to have him here with us this evening. If I were to read his accomplishments, there wouldn't be time for a lecture tonight. I, his CV is incredible, and he is an internationally influential author and speaker, a full professor of criminology at the University of Ottawa, and president of the International Organization for Victim Assistance. I met a few of his graduate students here, so I know that he is actively engaged as an educator in this area as well. He earned his master's in economics and a PhD in law in the area of criminology from Cambridge University in England, not too shabby. Uh, following his large-scale evaluation of the Canadian prison and parole system and appointment as an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the early 1970s, he served Canada as a senior official on research and statistics files including the abolition of the death penalty, gun control, dangerous offender legislation, and prevention of violence against women. He is still actively engaged in a distinguished career as an academic and has published well over 100 peer-reviewed articles and other publications. In 1985, he won international awards for his contributions to the UN General Assembly resolution that adopted the Declaration on Principles of Justice for Victims. His work to use evidence and best practice to stop victimization has won recognition around the world, particularly for his role as a founding executive director of the International Center for Prevention of Crime affiliated with the United Nations. He has advised the governments of more than 50 countries in both the advanced and developing world, including working with Nelson Mandela. His recent and popular trilogy of books, now in multiple languages, use the accumulated evidence and best practices to show policymakers how they can invest in people to sustainably prevent violence, stop thousands of needless deaths, and avoid harm to victims. He has his own website, www.irvinwaller.org, and he tweets it, at Irvin Waller. Please welcome this very distinguished speaker, Dr. Irvin Waller. It's uh, very humbling to have one's uh, 50 years of life history read out like that. I'm uh, actually quite nervous this evening because not only do I have uh, two of my children in the audience, but I have two of my grandchildren in the audience. So I'm very proud that they have uh, fought the weather to uh, join us here uh, this evening. Now, I, I, I've been to some of these lectures in the past, and they're about the past. They're about uh, wars that were fought and the particular role of major leaders in those wars. And my war is in the future. I want this event here to encourage you to hold Canadians' feet to the fire, to enable us to have the most peaceful communities that current knowledge can give us. So the title is shaping Canada. So I hope that this event is just a step in a stage of events that will lead over the next uh, two or three years to real investments in reducing violence in, in, in Canada and giving us uh, a special role as a beacon for other countries across the world. Yes, for developing countries, but also for advanced countries. So I thought I would start with a couple of Unitarian quotes uh, because I am a member of this congregation and I'm very proud of the university that I went to, but I have to admit that the Unitarians did a good job at Harvard. As you may know, that is a Unitarian trust. But what you probably don't know 
is that the second uh, US president, you can't actually read the subtitle here, John Adams, uh, was a Unitarian. And he was like me. He came from some other mystical uh, religion, I think Episcopalian or something quite close to my upbringing, to become a very important president, the second president in the United States. And I think it's rather wonderful to see, if you go back uh, nearly 300 years, to read this, because this is actually what my presentation is about in order to give us a foundation to actually stop violence on our streets and in our homes. So facts are stubborn things, and uh, whatever our governments try to do, you can't get away from them. And it's nice to see that they were already talking about you can't alter the state of facts or evidence. And it's evidence that gives me the confidence to encourage you to have the confidence to get our politicians to do what is right for Canada, right for Canadians, right for men and women who are non-Indigenous, and particularly right for men and women and children who are Indigenous. My second quote comes from where my sister lives, near one of the major uh, Unitarian churches in New England. So Thoreau, who many of you have heard of, was also a Unitarian and very influential. And this, this particular slogan is particularly important because I meet all over Canada and in other countries the liberals of the world, the left of center people who want to make the world better. And I listen, and I listen to the news at night, CBC, and everybody wants to do something about solitary confinement, opioid deaths, um, getting justice in the courts, stopping police beating up on uh, ethnic minorities. I'm not going to say anything about those things because the solution to all those things is what I'm going to talk about. There are indeed thousands of people in this country fighting, tackling the branches. And there are very few striking at the roots. I know that my students are here and they want to strike at the roots. I know several of you are here who want to strike at the roots. But I hope that by the end of my talk and by the chance that we have to exchange, that more of you will want to strike at the roots. Because the solution to most of those horrible problems is not more money, is not more caring that only goes to reacting after the fact. The solution is all before. It's people-centered, evidence stuff that gets to the roots of these issues. So, my ambition for however many uh, few years that I'm allowed to work on this planet in relation to Canada is to foster with you two measurable objectives. Two measurable objectives. Remember John Adams. So one of these is to bring our uh, rates of uh, street violence, that's people shooting each other and fighting each other, young men mostly, usually poor but not always, and our rates of intimate partner and sexual violence that is primarily a burden for women to bear, and particularly homicides because they're the tip of that iceberg down to the rates that are the average for G7 countries without the United States. So those G7 countries are basically shown on this slide. And you see here that Canada is actually a basket case. Yes, I mean it. Our homicide rate is double that of Germany four or five times that of Japan. We are one of the richest countries on this earth. 
we have the knowledge and the, the commitment to bring our rates down to those of other major nations. I didn't say Sweden. I didn't say Netherlands. By the way, Netherlands brought their crime rate down so far that they're actually renting out their prisons. And when I met recently with an advisor to Jody Raybould Wilson, I said, well, you know, uh, Trump, this is great news. If you bring the violence rate down, you're going to bring the incarceration down, and you can rent your prisons to the United States. Yeah, they laughed, but I'm quite serious. That is achievable for us. That is achievable for us. And you just have to look at these homicide rates. Now, I, oh, my other ambition, and this goes to the introduction, is to bring the rates for indigenous persons down to the same as we're going to achieve for our national levels. I'll just show you a little bit of what this looks like. So, we have a national inquiry on murdered and missing uh, indigenous women. This is very important. Very important. And actually, it's even more important than you think because the incarceration rates for women are actually far worse proportionately than for men. But if you actually look here, we should also be concerned about men. There are about 40 women, you know, maybe it's 50, but 40 to 50 Aboriginal women who are murdered or missing in this country. There are over 100 men. So we have to be worried about both. I didn't say don't do the inquiry. I just said we have to worry about both. And we've got a long way to go. Those rates are all six times what happens for uh, ordinary, non-indigenous people. And these rates are largely explained by the lack of social policy that focuses on it, and they are not in any way explained by the way that we spend our money today. So, you're all already thinking this guy is crazy, he's a dreamer. Uh, by the way, John Quincy Adams talked about people dreaming things. Um, but uh, it's interesting. You know, we can achieve this. We don't have to worry about what's going on south of the border. We don't even have to worry about what's going on in the European Union. Uh, we don't have to worry about that. Everything that we knew, need to do to reduce violence in our homes and on our streets and to reduce those homicide rates is within our power to do, including money. Including money. This is just a question of political choice. Political choice. The federal government, the provincial government, the municipal governments, that they begin to take this seriously and do what is right and invest in young, vulnerable people and do a range of other things. Uh, People-centered, evidence-based strategies. All of this is possible. It requires us to help them do it. And let me just give you a few of their commitments. Sustainable development goals. You probably thought that these were all for third world countries. Yes, they're for third world countries, but they're for us as well. There is as much for Germany, the United States, as for us. So we need to take these seriously. And in those sustainable goals is a target of reducing violence against women and girls significantly the word actually is eliminating by 2030. Remember 2030, it's going to come up a lot. There is another one that has to do with significantly reducing uh, violence and homicides. There are others about traffic crime that I'm not going to talk about, but the same things I'm talking to you about uh, focusing on violence apply to those, and they apply to drugs. They're all there. Canada is committed to those. Canada is doing nothing absolutely nothing today to achieve those objectives. So we need to help them do that. They're committed to it. We just need to help them, remind them, help them see how to do it. 
the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It doesn't actually talk that much about stopping violence, believe it or not, when you see those statistics. But it has a 10-year uh, achievement objective to reduce incarceration down to the level for non-indigenous people. You cannot achieve that in any way except through prevention. Restorative justice will not do it. Um, glad you and being nicer to uh, indigenous people won't do it. It hasn't done it. It won't do it. Our system is a retributive system like most countries in the world. And if you do the time, if you do the crime, you'll do a particular calculation of, of time. You cannot do it by just saying we're going to do it. Prevention, prevention, prevention. You can also read their mandate letters. I just got a letter um, a few weeks ago from uh, Minister Goodale, the Minister of Public Safety, because I work with the Canadian Victim Resource Center, and we, a year ago, sent them a letter as to what they should do about sexual assault in Canada. You've probably forgotten the Gomeshi affair. A year later, we're talking again about sexual assault. Now we're blaming the police because they don't do things right, and we've got some judge, and uh, we can go on for some time about this. That letter talked to him about the prevention of sexual assault. It talked to him about how police should help people who have been sexually assaulted, which is primarily by implementing what Ban Ki-moon, my grandson is here, he heard Ban Ki-moon at Glebe School, um, talking to him about a year ago, and it's basically you hire more female police officers. You do some other things, but that's the main way that you, 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 you do it. You gender policing. We gave him a number of other uh, ideas. We got a nice letter back, but we certainly didn't see any shift in what ultimately matters, which is stopping women from being victims of sexual violence. But these letters, these mandate letters, are interesting. They talk about evidence, like John Adams. They talk about uh, greatest impact. I'm going to show you where there's impact in a moment. It talks about feedback from Canadians. We think, because we've just come out of the Harper Age, this is the congregation of uh, Tony Turner and um, uh, Harper Man, and I've met several of the singers with uh, Tony Turner the, 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 this evening. Uh, we think that the Harper period was a disastrous period, and, and I largely uh, agree with that. But he actually didn't change a whole lot. He was mean, yes, but he was mean. So he didn't actually expand the prison population because he didn't give them any money. And unlike the Brits, we have not been putting too many people into our federal prisons. It's mostly a provincial problem. But what you don't know is that with the exception of conservative party folk, Canadians are more than two to one in favor of investing in prevention. Conservatives are about 50-50. It's very interesting. It, men, women, indigenous, non-indigenous, uh, educated, rich, poor, everybody uh, the only thing that differentiates is membership in the Conservative Party. And it just, it, even that only brings it down to 50%. So this is important. People actually agree. You think you're exceptions because you agree with this statement? You're not exceptions. You're not exceptions at all. Talk to the people on the bus. I don't do it because I'm busy on my machine, but if I did, you would find exactly this. When I do this with my students, you get about 90%, but then they're in criminology. I think even if you went to the law faculty, you, because it says uh, you're paying for lawyers, you would still get uh, something quite close to this. So the public is committed to this. Now the challenge for me, and this is, this is where my professional lifeblood comes from, is doing, making a difference to the number of people who are victims of violence and reducing the harm. We have to talk about that. We have to focus on it. Let those people hacking at the branches worry about 
conditions in prison. Howard Sapers, you probably know the correctional uh, uh, investigator, he's now moved from uh, Ottawa to Toronto. He's a buddy of mine, and he said, Irvin, I need a get out of jail card. And I said, this is easy. You're, you're advising the Ontario government on whether they should build more prisons? Tell them to invest in prevention. He looked at me and he said, uh, okay, you're right. Uh, so hopefully, he's not just going to bleat about the horrible conditions in the OCDC, which they are horrible, but he's actually going to do the things that will stop the overcrowding, the sleeping in cells, the sorts of uh, other conditions. So let's talk about this. So crime rates come down in Canada. Yeah, good news, great. These are 2014 statistics. So one violent crime for every 15 adults. These are not police stats, because in Canada, people don't go to the police as much as they do in other countries. These are surveys from Stats Canada. Property crime, one for seven. You can say, well, we're not too worried about property crime until they break into your house, and then you're worried. But certainly for violence, we can all see that we should be worried. I, I've already mentioned these uh, rates. Now, it's an interesting lack in our country that we talk all the time about violence against women. It was International Women's Day uh, on Sunday, and... Uh, oh, we sorry, we celebrated on Sunday. My wife isn't with me to remind me, but I was here on Sunday. And it's interesting that we don't care enough about this to measure it. We don't care enough to measure it. Remember, John Adam, facts. We do measure it, by the way, in studies in schools. We do measure it in some universities now, but we don't measure it nationally. So we don't really know, but maybe one in three women are raped. That's an international term that we don't use in Canada, but I think it gives you a, a good image. Um, while women are adult, and about one in three before they become adult. But whatever the rate is, it's way too much. And whatever the rate is, it's eminently preventable if we choose to measure it and to focus on those measures. So, uh, Paula said, I have a master's degree in economics. So you're going to see me use a little bit, some numbers here. And, you know, when you think of what it's like to be a victim of violent crime, when you think that you weren't expecting it, the first thing, and you think of what it did to you, and you think, well, you don't think after it because you're numb and you don't know what to do, and um, trauma and stuff comes back to you, and your life has changed, and the life of the people you live with has changed. and uh, It's difficult to attach a number to those life experiences. And many of you here have had those life experiences. Too many of you have had those life experiences. One of the ways we can get, though, an idea of the extent of this harm is by looking at what a civil court would pay you if you were a victim of that sort of violence. And in Canada, we've rolled this up. Jeff, sitting in the front here, helped me revise these figures. You come out with a figure of $55 billion. That is about $10 billion in tangible harm and about $45 billion in that pain, suffering. And pain, I think, is important. You know, you have a knife wound. Oh, it sounds just a knife wound. They just remove the knife, they sew it up. Well, there's a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And the pain that is difficult to see is actually the pain that is most important. So that pain that is difficult to see, that change in the quality of life that you can never go back on, there isn't a pill that you can give. There isn't any um, neat little counselor underpaid who will help you uh, recover. They can support you, they can be empathetic, but they can't change what happened to you. Well, when you accumulate that, you get this figure of 
45 billion plus the 10 billion, this is 55 billion. Now, Ottawa, just a bit under a million, that means about 1.5 billion. 1.5 billion. So, uh, what are we doing at the moment? Well, we're spending a lot of money. $22 billion is what we spend on reacting. And this doesn't include those wonderful paramedics. Uh, it doesn't include what's paid in hospitals. This is just the wonderful system called the Canadian criminal justice system. And uh, this is what the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, their executive director, is a member of this congregation. Their next president is a Unitarian from Winnipeg. I can't see him in the audience, but he knows her personally. Um, so uh, this organization, they're the ones who got the money for housing, by the way. This is what they said about policing costs. The unsustainable growth in policing costs. Unsustainable growth. That's the first part. The, first, the second part is even worse. It's crowding out the early intervention and prevention. So the very things that would have stopped the violence from happening in the first place have been crowded out. Since 2000, we're spending $6 billion a year more. Total police budget about $14 billion. $6 billion. So don't tell me that we can't invest in the stuff that works when we've already spent an additional six billion on what doesn't work, what doesn't work, what doesn't bring our homicide rates down, even to that of Germany, that doesn't bring those homicide rates for indigenous women or indigenous men down to those other rates. So, um, let's look at the, the news these days. So, too many overcrowded jails. So, what are we going to do? NACV, our Attorney General, he's going to add guards and he's going to build prisons. How stupid can you be? And I mean it. How stupid can you be? Clog criminal courts, gang guys, charges dropped. They can't even organize their prosecutors to get the main ones done. But the solution is more of it. They didn't do it right, so that we're going to give them more prosecutors and more judges. How stupid can you be? The opioid crisis. Well, there's some good news in the opioid crisis, because while most of it is talking about safe consumption sites, safe injection sites, so on and so forth, Trudeau actually said that we need to go after mental health, housing, and job opportunities. It's a verbatim quote. I fell off my chair. I thought, my God, I'm going to be talking on Tuesday night, and that I, I can actually bring some good news, at least in words from our Prime Minister. So, the other thing about that system is its bias. I told you about the homicide rates. Now look at the incarceration rates. For men, it's only 10 to 1. For women, it's 20 to 1. How crazy can we be? How crazy can we be? And we haven't done anything about that. I was saying to Francis, I remember in the 70s, we didn't have that good statistics. We actually don't have that good statistics today. It hasn't changed. Even though we've known this, it hasn't changed. So, solutions. The most effective, cost-effective way to deal with crime is prevention. All the rest is picking up the pieces. So let's do that. So what are some of the things that, that, that work? So, um, in the last five years, suddenly the prestigious organizations of the world have told us that the evidence that somebody like me or somebody like my students knew 10 or 15 years ago. They've agreed it. They've not only agreed it, you can get it on your smartphone anytime you want. So any board politician in parliament who actually wanted to do something about crime can go on these websites and see what works. The World Health Organization, I'm very proud, I can't actually 
legitimately say I got them to come to Ottawa, but I worked very hard on this. They're coming here this October, and I want Canada to have done something by October so that we don't look like the dummies that we currently are on prevention. It's ironic that the U.S. Department of Justice has one of the best websites because they ignore it. It doesn't mean to say we should ignore it. And then there's an advisory group to the legislature in Washington that gives us all the returns. So let's see some of the things. So, you know those high crime areas? They exist everywhere in the world. In Ottawa, Toronto, Winnipeg, choose your place. Downtown Eastside, obviously Vancouver is the poorest postal code in Canada. It's not surprising that one in three are intravenous drug users. So, in those problem places, what should we do? Youth outreach. The Brits, not so good at most things, they did this. They did it in 70 areas. They evaluated it, very important, large reductions in youth offending, large reductions in crime. We should be doing this in every city from coast to coast. It's not a big money item, but you have to open those youth centers. Why does Montreal have fewer homicides than Ottawa? Because they did those, some of those youth centers. We can talk about a Canadian invention, stop now and plan. Basically, they teach young kids to stop, think, and plan. This is not think twice, which you may have heard about on the media. This is actually something that works. And then we have in the audience a representative from Triple P, the stuff that we can do with parents. It's called Triple P, Positive Parenting Programming. It's beginning to spread in Canada. Wonder. These are all proven. They all give you 50% or better reductions in violence. Now, I know that there are other things that people like. These are proved. Proven. If we just chose to put money into the proven ones and continue some nice things, we would uh, reduce crime by 50%. That would bring us down to Germany. Next, in schools and universities, suddenly the University of Ottawa, my university, discovered that we had sexual violence on campus. We were embarrassed into discovering it. So, what do we do? We know what to do. Bystander intervention. Schools, we know about sexual violence in schools. Fourth R, program tested and invented in Ontario, believe it or not. These all give you 50% reductions in sexual violence on campus or in schools. Every school from coast to coast in this country should have fourth R in it and being practiced and being evaluated. And the same for every university. And these are programs that go more than anything after the men. These are not self-defense courses for women. These are changing male behavior, which is what you have to change. In the health sector, a guy comes in with a knife wound. So up the wound, he goes out, he comes back with a knife wound two months later, or maybe he's dead when he comes back. This is a fantastic place to intervene with social outreach. We now have a program in Winnipeg doing that. PTSD. My students know about it because the emergency people suffer PTSD. Well, victims suffer PTSD. That's where it came from. We need to focus on that, and that's how we stop their decline into addictions and many other difficulties. One of the best ways of mobilizing people in the city around prevention is actually analyzing people coming into emergency rooms. Cardiff, uh, within this uh, city in Wales, a 40% reduction within a year. We should be doing this in every hospital in this country. Police services, yeah, the things they can do. Um, they can focus on repeat victimization in problem places. And there are other things that have been shown to work. They don't do them. They don't do them. They do the PR stuff. The PR stuff is called prevention. It isn't prevention. Uh, you have to do the things that actually uh, work. In, um, in Toronto, the task force looking at the future of policing is going to cut policing by 10% in Toronto. 10%. Long overdue. And one of the ways they're going to do that is by 
partnering, allowing those social agencies that I mentioned to actually do the things. But you have to give them money to do it. Cities. City of Glasgow. I know there's at least one person in the audience from Glasgow. Well, Glasgow um, was actually a senior police officer who said, uh, I'm fed up with picking up the phone to homicides. In Glasgow, they're all recorded on CCTV. You know exactly who did it. It's, it's easy to arrest, to catch, convict, and incarcerate. So, he said, this ain't a solution. So what's he going to do? He brings in an epidemiologist, that's somebody who analyzes the history of these kids, where the problems are, and then you go from that diagnosis to a plan, to implementing it, and bingo, within three years, you get a 50% reduction. Every city in Canada uh, that has a street violence problem, and that's almost every city in Canada, uh, can do this. It's not expensive, but you, you, you just need to decide that you're going to do it. So, I've made the case, I hope, it's better to drain the swamp than fight the alligators. And yeah, we need some alligator fighting police guys to do the alligator fighting um, until we actually get more of this prevention stuff happening. So we have to act now. I'm coming back to those goals, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we can get to those goals. So um, we need to shape our communities. Now, we're not actually the mayors and the city councils, but uh, we have to get to them. We have to get to the politicians. We have to get to the people who can shape. And we have to be the people who are mobilizing to do that shaping. And that, what that means is uh, we need legislation. NACV has been talking and talking before him. Mayor, these are both... Uh, Ottawa uh, MPPs have been talking and talking and talking about Ontario legislation. Doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. They need to do it. It's not that expensive. There are models to look at from other countries. Sweden is one of them. France is another. We can legislate. We need to have a plan. Lawyers, case by case. It's like the Royal Bank. They do it case by case, but the Royal Bank gets rich on it case by case. Our criminal justice system fails case by case. We have to do it by looking at the overall picture. We have to have a plan, and that plan has to have objectives, and it has to have targets, and it has to be measurable. And yes, we need to put money. Remember the six billion? Well, we spent more and more on policing. I've no idea why we spent so much more on policing, because their recorded crime rate was actually going down, but we did. So if we could afford six billion a year more for policing, and surely we can afford two billion now. Two billion happens to be what my book uses, which is 10 percent, equivalent of 10 percent of what the criminal justice system costs. So two billion is affordable. It doesn't all have to be federal. A lot of it needs to be federal, a lot of it needs to be provincial. Don't look to municipalities, they only get 8% of the tax budget. But we need money. We have to make up for that lag. So, yeah, sorry folks, you've been sitting through this lecture. I haven't given you all the knowledge, but I've given you some of it. So, yeah, for the harm done by the offender, he's accountable, but for the harm done because we don't do something to make a change, we are accountable for not acting. We need to act within our comfort zones. And I know one person here thinks I should work beyond my comfort zone. So we can all work beyond our comfort zones on this. So this is my last slide, and then we're going to have a, a chance to uh, talk backwards and forwards, and you can take me to task. But these are just a few of uh, the thoughts. Uh, I have to uh, credit that these aren't necessarily my original thoughts. Uh, some of these came from, from Francis, and some of them came from those working together uh, on these. And this isn't an exhaustive list, 
But these are four things that each of us could be thinking about. So obviously the first thing is Jody Raybould Wilson talks about tackling causes. She's the Minister of Justice, and she talks about uh, restorative justice, and she talks about reducing incarceration. So let's help her do it. What she's done is a task force of lawyers looking at minimum penalties and those sorts of things. That has never worked anywhere in the world. Now, it may be a reaction to Harper, but that isn't what's going to give us safety. That wouldn't have worked in South Africa. That isn't what uh, even Germany relies on. We need to do the things that we know work. And I've given you, I guess, a teaser to know some of those things. And I can tell you where to go to find out more if you want to do that. So we need to get together with a reminder of the commitments of the mandates and of our own speeches and say we actually want visible action. We need to need, meet with other politicians. NACFI, in my view, understands everything I've said to you today. I don't know why he doesn't act, and my graduate students and I were shocked when he announced more prosecutors. You, you've got a jail that's flooded with people, and you hire more prosecutors. If you hire more police and you hire more prosecutors, you get more people in prison. With Jeff, I told him I would not say anything nasty about the United States, but if you want proof, just look at what Nixon and Reagan and Clinton did in the United States. Clinton, by the way, added 20% or tried to add 20% more cops. Janet Reeder, parents were alligator fighters, I love it. She wanted to drain the swamp, woman, attorney general, but she lost. We do not need to go down that path. We need to go down our own path, our own path towards greater safety. We need to get people like NACVI to do the right thing, and save money and do stuff that is ultimately popular. Women do not want to be victims of violence. Indigenous people do not want to be victims of violence. And even us men don't want to be victims of violence. So he needs to do things and not just procrastinate and make speeches. He needs to do things. We pay him. We pay him. Our taxes go to that. We need to look at how we can work with a number of other folk who are somewhere in the same field as us. So cities. Two graduate students here and I are working with a coalition of cities from coast to coast. They're getting organized. Uh, we haven't reached the bingo stage. But they're an important group. The big city mayors, very important group. So we need to work with them. We can work with other churches. We can work with the indigenous groups. We can even work with some of the professional associations. Even the chiefs of police, by the way, are in largely in agreement with what I'm saying, both the provincial and the federal chiefs of police. So we need to look at how we can do that. And uh, we, we don't have the money to bring people together, but governments, if you lived in the 70s in Canada and in the 80s, uh, that's how governments brought about change. They held... Uh, meetings where they talked about what they were going to do uh, 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 about the issues from everything from capital punishment to gun control to what we were going to do after it. We need to go back to doing that, to having open, transparent discussions, to get a, a debate going. We have to get the media. The media are actually one of the biggest enemies for, this, uh, for the sorts of things that I'm talking about. Because they, they get on these case-by-case -case problems, and they're depressing. Um, they don't give you any way of doing anything about depressing other than watching Rick Mercer or 22 Minutes or going and watching some American satire thing done by a Brit. That's the John Oliver show. So um, we can also volunteer. We can become mentors. We can volunteer on uh, boards of organizations. There are many ways that you may already be volunteering. 
And let's thank Dr. Irvin Waller for this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Doug.